Welcome to the Wellbeing Room. Today, I am very excited to have with me in the Wellbeing Room, Rafe Kelly. Now, Rafe is the founder of Evolve Move Play. And Evolve Move Play provides outdoor movement education and training to build healthier humans and is guided by a philosophy of movement that emphasizes the practices that afford a deeper sense of purpose and fulfillment in life. Now, that's no short order there. So I'm going to be asking Rafe a few questions about that today to, to unpack that in a bit more detail. Now, at six years old, Rafe began studying martial arts. And at 15, he was studying gymnastics. At 23, he discovered parkour and became the first parkour, one of the first parkour teachers in North America and co-founded one of the most highly respected parkour teaching institutions in the world. Rafe's students have included... Of course, world-class parkour athletes, um, MMA fighters, and even untrained grandmothers. And the common theme in their responses to his approach is that it is a life it is life changing on many levels. His passion is to help people build the physical practice that will help them help make them the strongest, most adaptable, and resilient version of themselves in movement and in life. And I just really love that, that vision that Rafe has. Um, and there's a guiding question or a couple of guiding questions that have seemed to come up for him and, and really direct uh, where he's going, which is what does it mean to move like a human, to be truly competent to move as humans evolve to move? And this is something that really inspires me. I love this idea of how we have evolved as humans over millennia. Um, and I think that is written into our DNA. And it's something that has come up in my own yoga practice with my own yoga teacher, this idea of um, how we embody this evolution and, and movement is a really big part of that. So welcome, Rafe. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I love the intro. Thank you very much, Leah. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to add to that or yep, just happy to, to dive right in excellent so in. yeah brilliant so um firstly i just want to acknowledge um your time today so thank you for being here but uh mm -hmm. talking about evolve move play like i guess the first question i'm just going to just dive in right deep here so um, why evolve move play there's three really clear distinct terms there um, what do these terms encompass uh, and what is the meaning behind them for you yeah when I founded the brand I was looking for a name for an approach to natural movement um, or a, a, or maybe a holistic you know full spectrum movement training uh, approach and at the time I was very deeply influenced by play research and by evolutionary biological research, and I, I, I was actually not a big fan of the term natural in natural movement because I think that it is, it, it's um, it's a difficult word. It's a friend of mine calls these types of words fudgy because natural can mean many different things, right? It's a marketing word for one thing. It's mm -hmm. you know like. If you buy a product and it's called natural, it actually doesn't mean anything at all. Mm. And so it's devalued in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. It also um, can mean natural from like an evolutionary perspective, or it could mean natural from like a dogmatic religious perspective. So somebody who mm. is very religious might say that it's not natural for men to sleep with men because, mm. um, because God didn't intend that. And so that, that, that ambiguity around the term natural was something that I was trying to, to get more clear on yeah. by thinking about it as not movement that is just natural to us, but movement that reflects our evolutionary heritage. Mm. Yeah. So there was something about movement, something about evolution and something about play that were fundamental to what I was doing. And I batted around a bunch of different names and I just said, okay, I've all moved play. Mm -hmm. And I thought of it as, the sense is that we are creatures that evolve. That's a really important thing. Like a, a lot of this is a respect for human nature. Mm -hmm. There's that word again, but there isn't in many aspects of our culture, a deep respect for the fact that we are products of evolution. So how did we evolve? So we evolved and we evolved to move. We didn't evolve to be sedentary creatures living in a digital ecosystem. Mm. And we evolved to learn movement primarily through play. Mm -hmm. So we predominantly as a culture are limiting play and trying to 
educate people into movement through formalized, drudgerous, basically industrial factory approaches to trying to gain exercise and it's failing. Yeah. We have a $30 billion fitness industry in the United States. Yeah. Um, and we have the least fit population of human beings that have ever walked the planet. Mm, yeah. So that industrial uh, factory model of fitness, um, it, it's a failure. And I think the, 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 the reason is because we don't respect the underlying system it's actually how nature designed us to, mm. how we evolved yeah. to develop fitness, which is actually predominantly motivated through play. Mm. Yeah. And that was the sense was if we can build something that leverages the power of play, that respects the evolutionary heritage of the human being, and that educates us in movement, that's going to be the strongest way to build happy, healthy humans. Mm. You got your work cut out for you there by the sounds of it. (laughs) But I so hear what you're saying. I I used to, I actually trained to be a phys ed teacher. Um, I was teaching in a primary school for a number of years. And yeah, it was interesting. Um, I was never really a sporty kid at all, Mm -hmm. actually. And I kind of fell into phys, like PE teaching because I wanted to be a yoga teacher. And I kind of, that was my sort of way into long story, but I think I did a podcast episode about it, but yeah, it's interesting how I think we encourage children, especially to, to play and, and do games and learn sports and things like that. And, and I always tried to use games as a way in um, when I was studying to be a PE teacher, there was this thing called game sense, which was used a lot in um, teaching team sports and things like that. So it's understanding, it's not just basically teaching a skill, getting the kids to mm-hmm. practice it and then going, all right, let's put this in a game, but it's actually, um, you know, you start off with modified games, which is kind of, a, I think what you do in, in your That's, retreats and things like that, you know, so modified versions of the, the actual game that you want to teach, whether it's soccer or you know, um, Mm -hmm. netball or basketball or whatever, even like softball and things like that. You do modified versions where the kids get put into situations that are similar to the real game and they have to make decisions and, and, and things like that and try and use the basic skills. And as they're going through these versions of these modified games, they're, they're, they're picking up that game sense, that understanding of play and, and how to use the skills so that they can become a more well, well-rounded player. And I used to love teaching that, that methodology of um, doing, you know, that because, for me as well, I was still learning how to play the games myself. So, so, and asking questions as we go, you know, why, why would you use that technique here? Or, or you know, what did you do to in, try and score a point there, that type of thing. So um, I guess that cognition side of things, as well as the physical and the play all coming together. Um, but what I do notice in society, and this is something you've probably picked up on as well, is that, you know, kids play sport until they're you know a certain age they might play as they get older you know there's sort of the 20 to maybe 40 year olds you know playing some team sports Mm. still if that's their thing um but then it either falls by the wayside because they're too busy now with their kids you know kids are playing sports so they sacrifice their own you know, physical uh, well-being to to look after the children and, and to promote sport to the children or, or they just doesn't happen at all and they just never play anything. So I guess I'm curious, what's, what's your, how have you seen that play out in your community and, and how does what you do potentially help people, I guess, overcome maybe some barriers to moving as they get older? Because I think that's something that's promoted a lot in kids, you know, movement and play and and sport and things like that. Um, but as we get older, that that tends to fall by the wayside. So I'm just curious about your experience with people in that regard. Yeah. So the problem of how to keep people moving as we grow older, it's a big problem mm. because um, I just mentioned the, the, prior, the prioritization of play and why it's so important. Mm. Um, there's a flip side of that, which is that as animals uh, develop, they go from playing a lot as juveniles to playing substantially less as adults. Mm. So um, in a sort of hunter forager population or a traditional uh, human population, the adults uh, are going to spend most of their movement time doing physical tasks related to survival. Mm. So you go from having a survival necessity or you go from having a play drive to having a survival necessity that that motivates movement. Um, 
there's often though a sense of joy in the movement even that comes from that that's that's functional as adults right so women sing and dance and use rhythms to organize uh, the production of baskets or ropes or clothing. Mm. Um, men will sing and take great joy in hunting and fishing. Um, climbing trees is actually a huge component of hunter for of foraging in many cultures. Mm. Trees are where we get the uh, the richest sources of, of calories in many environments because it's where you find eggs, honey, and fruit. Mm. Um, there's, yeah, it's quite interesting. Hunter forager populations that live in tropical forests climb almost as much as chimpanzees. Yeah, wow. Um, which is quite astonishing to 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 read about. So, so we we continue to move and we continue to find joy in movement as adults, but we don't have the same drive to just play necessarily. Mm. And what happens as adults age into Western cultures is that. The, the necessities of life, which can be very stressful, take us out of that. Mm. Now, the, the fact that people hunt for pleasure and fish for pleasure and rock climb for pleasure all indicates that we still retain this capacity for play even later into life. And that play often looks like functional tasks that were involved in our evolutionary background. But it is easy for adults to lose that and to fall into an attractor well of sedentism because they have to make money by sitting in front of the computer. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there's some, some issue there that has to be overcome. But the other issue is that we are actually training people out of movement from an early age. Most people don't realize this, but the Western educational system was designed specifically to prepare people to be factory workers. Mm, yeah. So you don't want people who are creative and movement oriented and want to do all sorts of interesting things with their bodies mm -hmm. uh, in a factory. You want someone who's willing to sit still and do the same thing over and over and over again for, you know, in the original factories, like 16 hours. Mm. Um, and that's the model. So we sit children in chairs and we try to produce knowledge in them like a factory. Mm. And when they move, we punish them. Yeah. So we have this whole culture of literally giving amphetamines to young children mm. to because amphetamines kill the play drive. That's what they do. Mm. So so what we call ADHD, a lot of that is just children with particularly high needs for movement, mm. yeah. particularly strong play drives. Yeah. And we are we are inhibiting that play drive in children, literally chemically. Mm. That's how critical it is to the system to sustain itself. Um, but not only do we do that, so we, we're constantly telling children, don't run, don't jump, don't climb, don't roughhouse, or you'll be punished. Mm. Or you'll literally be drugged. It's a scary world, um, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a horrible, horrible thing to think about what, what we're doing. Um, and then, uh, then we we replace so we replace unstructured playtime, which is children's natural. Th this is quite an interesting study that I mm -hmm. saw recently on uh, horse tendons. Mm -hmm. So you have three three groups of young horses. One group is kept completely sedentary. Mm -hmm. The other is allowed free play in lots of pasture. Mm -hmm. And the third is kept sedentary, but then given periods of structured exercise. Mm -hmm. So the tendons of the horses that have free play become extremely robust and strong. The tendons of the horses that are sedentary atrophy and do not grow properly. Mm. But the tendons of the horses that are exercised also do not grow strong. Mm. Children will self-select exercise levels that are appropriate for them yeah. that will make them strong when given access to unstructured play. But we don't give children access to unstructured play. Mm. We don't structure our society such that children have access to unstructured play. Yeah. We try to replace it with formal sports. Mm. And when we formalize sports, we fundamentally take children's play and we are professionalizing it and we're putting a frame on it that is not what children do. Mm. So uh, children play to maintain fun, yeah. much more so than to win. Yeah. And so they will handicap and they will negotiate the rules of the game constantly to make sure that everyone can 
stay in the game because they're trying to sustain their their training partners. Mm. When you, um, uh, the Yak Panks have did some research on rats that showed rats are highly motivated to wrestle. Mm. Um, if you allow a rat that's 10% bigger to wrestle with another juvenile rat that's 10% smaller, the 10% bigger rat is bigger is enough bigger that it will win the first, the first wrestling bout every time. Mm. And after that, it's the smaller rat who has to invite the bigger rat to play. Yeah. But they're highly motivated and they will play. Yeah. But if they are allowed to match up repeatedly, unless the small, the larger rat handicaps himself such that the smaller rat can win at least 30% of the time. Mm. Smaller rat will no longer invite play with the larger rat. Mm. And the larger rat, because he's dominant, isn't allowed to invite play, basically. Yeah. And so play will actually extinguish itself without this handicapping. Mm. Yeah, it's something that also I remember Brene Brown talks about in one of her talks about play and play mm. research, how, you know, like bears yeah. and things like that will, you know, they'll wrestle each other and then they'll sort of, yeah, skitter away but come back. And, you know, it's that whole idea of, you know, like, we're playing for yeah. fun. It, it's for fun, not for, you know, winning the competition. And, and it's interesting that you say about the rats and everything and the, how that correlates to people, because I think in some instances where children are really pushed into sport or, you know, play a lot of sport, they, mm-hmm. that kind of, they kind of lose that, that fun element. Mm-hmm. Like it's all about the winning, like they have to win or they want to win or they don't feel good if they're not winning. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh to to continue my thought that Mm. you if you take kids from unstructured play and you put them in formal sports where they are where the rules are dictated by adults where they're not allowed to self-regulate and to negotiate the rules and and where there's a a strong emphasis on winning what happens is that in any cohort of of kids there's going to be some who are not sufficiently successful Mm. to sustain motivation yeah And essentially what we're doing is we're taking their play circuitry and their movement circuitry and we're punishing it out of existence. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, you know, let's say you're, you have a group of six-year-olds and they all start playing soccer. So some of those six-year-olds are almost seven. Some of them just turned six. Yeah. Some of them are very tall for their age. Some of them are very short for their age. Some of them are, uh, you know, ahead with gross motor movement. Some of them are behind gross motor movement. And the difference that you see in six-year-olds may have very low correlation with what their genetic potential is long-term. Mm. But if you take those six-year-olds and you and you create a meritocracy of six-year-olds and you give them playing time based on that, mm. or or the kids who are more successful just dominate the less successful kids and there's no negotiation within the kids, yeah. what's happening is those kids who are at the bottom of the, of the competence ladder there they're actually experiencing sport as punishing and negative. Mm. So some of them don't want to come out for soccer again the next year. Yeah. Yeah. Now you take the most successful kids and you put them in select soccer. Mm. And now some of them are going to be the bottom of the heap of the select soccer. And now they're getting punished. Mm. And so I've, I've seen this over and over again, athletes who, uh, who are, who've come to train with me, who are at 14 years old, national class runners or jumpers or soccer players and burned out of their sport by the time they were 15 years old, mm. by the time they were 16 years old, the pressures are too high. And we, we see that particularly in young women, mm. the, the rate at which young women uh, reject sport in their early teens is very, very high. Yeah. So we we've adopted a system that I believe actually punishes a, a, a significant minority of children in every cohort mm. for engaging in sport. And over time, we are selecting down and winnowing down. It's like okay, so everyone gets to play soccer mm. in elementary school, but then by but but then to qualify for the high school soccer team, you have to be very very select. But even in that very select group, mm. some of the kids are going to be riding the bench. Yeah, yeah, and. This doesn't mean we need to create a, a sport culture where there's no achievement, no meritocracy, and everyone gets a, a participation trophy. That's not healthy for children either. They see those differences. Yeah. What they need is a play culture that's oriented around unstructured play for them, where they start from a very young age being focused on the joy of the experience, yeah, not on this structured uh, adult-imposed play. Yeah. And so I think that Inter- making children exercise in ways that are drudgerous and boring, which is what we do in PE, 
making uh, punishing children for moving, which is what we're doing in sport, and then just just drugging them or punishing them out of movement eight hours a day during school, mm. and then sending them home to play video games or watch TV. Yeah. Of course, we have a giant problem with movement in our culture. We are we're doing everything we can to create people who can't move. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. It's, actually, I'm, I'm glad you've summed that up really well because it, it is a problem. And and I actually want to jump into now what you talk about is your four pillars. I, I wonder if you can just quickly yeah. run through what your pillars are because I think they and um and the movement problems, like your full fundamental movement problems, because I think mm -hmm. that will help people sort of understand where you're coming from and and what you actually do. Yeah, yeah, we've we've been refining this concept for a while. Uh, we started with just um, it, if you go back to uh, the work of Georges Hebert, who founded the Natural Method, mm -hmm. he divided the functional movements that everyone needed to be competent into into ten different pieces. Walking, running, jumping, climbing, moving on all four, lifting, throwing, balancing, swimming, and self-defense. Hmm. So as I was developing what I did, I I saw that you could basically kind of divide those into three. The first would be locomotive movements, so walking, hmm. running, jumping, climbing, swimming. Then you'd have manipulative movements, lifting and throwing. Oh, and then balancing would be locomotion. And then you have uh, combat would be the last aspect. Hmm. So then over time, I recognized that there was an aspect of pra that dance had to be incorporated too. And then you could see dance and um, dance and combat as both species of interaction. Mm. So you have interaction movement. And then mm. even like working together is interaction, yeah. right? Mm. Sawing a, a, you know, doing a fire drill, like a team fire drill, that is a, that's, a, that's interaction. So how well can you coordinate with another, another living being? Mm. And then there's this aspect of practice, which is like the somatic structural layer of getting into your body and feeling it, something mm. like yoga. Mm. Um, and so we started thinking about that. So that would become some, so from those three, we ended up with four. And then we started thinking about movement in relationship to three other areas of practice, the mindfulness practices, nature connection practices, and community-oriented practices. Mm. Just very recently, um, as I was preparing for an interview that I did with Jordan Peterson, was reading through his work again, reading through my friend John Ravicki's work, and I kind of developed a new conceptualization, which I think captures this even better, mm -hmm. which is that fundamentally every individual has a uh, a set of fundamental relationships to the external world. Yeah. So the first is the relationships that are internal to the self, the stuff that's inside your skin. Yeah. So that's again, that somatic or structural layer. And, and it's both when you're an infant there, there's very little to no distinction between emotion and motoric output. Right. So you, mm. you don't feel sad. You cry. Mm. You don't feel angry. Your hands ball up and your face screws up. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You don't feel happy. You giggle and smile. Yeah. And over time, what literally is happening neurologically is you learn to inhibit the motoric output of those neurons. Right. Mm. So when you feel happy, you don't automatically smile. When you feel sad, you don't automatically cry, mm. but you, your body knows that it's sad. Yeah because those motor neurons are lighting up, they're just inhibited enough so that it's not expressed. Mm. Yeah. So, so within movement is actually inherently the guide to our emotions yeah. and even to our thinking. They're all deeply connected in, internally and then over time we're able to abstract them out. Yeah. So when we want to know the self, we actually start with a somatic and structural practice mm, yeah. but then the self is always the self actually doesn't end at the skin right mm. because what you are is also the the way that your body interacts with the world and how that affords you the capacity to achieve things so then the next thing is you know so um, in cognitive science to talk about four e's embodiment embeddedness enactedness and extendedness so the next e would be the embeddedness you have to be in the environment and that's where the locomotive 
and um, manipulative aspects of the practice come into me. And so again, if you go back to the infant, once the infant now has some motor capacity, they're trying to move themselves through the environment and trying to get a hold of things yeah. and explore what those things can offer them. Yeah. And so that's the second fundamental relationship. What, how, how does the physical world constrain us and what does it afford to us? Mm. How do we develop better relationships when you do parkour, when you um, play sport, when you learn to craft, when you learn to paint, you're literally mapping more meaning into the world through your capacity for motor output. Mm. And then... There's a relationship to other people. Yeah. And that starts as a baby with nursing and eye gazing, mm -hmm. right? Babies come pretty wired up with their mouths and their eyes to some degree. Yeah. And they start right away having to essentially negotiate this dance with their mother to make nursing happen, which is actually really complex and hard. Yes. <laughs> yep. I'm, I, I have three children. My wife had struggled with nursing all of them mm. they all were tongue-tied mm. um so it's it, people think it's a simple thing it's mm. it's actually a no. really complex no. motor problem yeah absolutely and and that's and so babies like when they come out their mouth is like most of their brain mm. is just to to make their mouth work yeah i need food i need nourishment um, yeah yeah and that's why they that's why they put everything in their mouth when they're little mm. because it's the biggest information source about the world so the baby when it puts its foot in its mouth it's actually like yeah in the embodied sense figuring out what a foot is yeah and mapping yeah. its foot into its brain yeah so um so you start you start with that and then you're eye gazing and then as you get bigger you start to push and pull and you know the baby's going to throw itself back it's going to move around mm. it'll it, it'll play peekaboo with you. It'll giggle like crazy if you turn it upside down, if you mm -hmm. wiggle with it, if you yeah. turn with it. And so now it's basically doing rough and tumble play and dance. Mm. And that's how you start to learn to negotiate the social world. That's how you start to embody what a relationship is. Yeah. And that's how you become, that's how you're able to begin extending your own neural structure into attunement and relationship with social and relational others. Mm. So we think that we're, we think in words, but that's late developmentally. Yeah. And so we, we exist in this world of words, but that whole world of words has this whole motor underpinning. Mm. And so when we engage with rough and tumble play, and when we engage with dance, that's actually taking us to the the primal roots mm. of what it is to connect to other living beings. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last relationship is the relationship to the transcendent. And this is something that taken me a long time to accept and to <laughs> articulate in a way that's satisfying to me. Mm. I grew up in the hippie community and I saw the word spirituality used in ways that allowed people to be narcissistic and abusive. Mm. Mm. And I, hated that word for the longest time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, understandably. But through the work of John Vakey and David Abram and, um, and John Young, I came to understand that, that individual agents in a social community are actually like neurons in a brain. They're a neural network mm -hmm. and that there are emergent intelligences that are above the level of the agent. So if you're walking through the forest mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it feels weird and you think maybe there's a predator nearby, it's because of the whole landscape of sound that the birds are producing. Mm. And if you're really attuned to the birds, yeah, you can hear where they're making some sound and where they're making no sound. Maybe there's some alarm calls here. Maybe it's totally quiet over here. And that will actually tell you where the predator is in the environment. And it's not any one bird. Mm. It's the birds. Yeah. So you can think of that as the spirit of the birds. And that's mm. how every traditional culture thought of it. Yeah. And so we have we exist within these collective intelligences that are above us. Google is a collective intelligence. It has its own momentum, mm. right? Its own power. It's incredibly powerful. Mm. Like our lives are determined by things like Google. Yeah. Um, but there's no, you can't go talk to Google. 
right? It doesn't have a central consciousness. I don't think it has an internality. I don't think mm. Google's sitting there thinking about itself. No, not in at this point in time. But it is an intelligence yeah. and it is vastly powerful. Mm. And so we have to recognize that there's powers and principalities or principles that exist above us always. And that we're always, we're always subservient to those things in some sense. And so those five relationships that we have with reality the, the quality of them, the depth of them, the nuance that we can achieve within them is actually the source of the potential for meaning in our life. Mm. And that's why it is incredibly important to build an ecology of practices that educates you in how to navigate the world with respect to all of those relationships. Yeah. Yeah, I have to agree. It's yeah, and that's what I love about what you do, what your work, and what you teach. Because I, I, interestingly, through my own and a path that I've been taking through life, I haven't been able to articulate those things. But I found teachers who who share those beliefs and ideas, and yeah, it's it's definitely a common theme that I've come across, and I've placed a lot of value in. So I'm really glad that there's people like yourself out there you know, who are upholding these and demonstrating them and teaching people about them because I think that's such a powerful thing. And just when you were talking about the baby and the young child, I, you know, I had this thing in my head about how children these days, especially young children, um, I just put in front of screens a lot. Um, when mm -hmm. my daughter was little, like we didn't actually put a TV on when she was awake until she was at least two years old. Like we kept the house pretty much screen free until she was at least two and then once she was that age, you know, we maybe watch a half hour of a show, you know, on one of the kids' channels, you know, like play school or whatever it was. Um, and we'd sit there with her and and watch it with her and, and sing the songs and do the movements together or whatever. Um, but I know a lot of people today, you know, as soon as their baby, even young children in prams, you know, are given phones or, you know, whatever they can to sort of distract them. And I'm, I'm really curious what your thoughts are about that and how that's having an impact on the development of the child and especially in relationship to these, these um, things that you've just described. Yeah. It's a, it's a battle that we all have to fight as parents, right? Like mm. I, we were the same with our oldest, you know, she didn't get TV until she was three years old. Um, and then the barriers broke down to some degree Yeah, and then it had to be rebuilt. And, you know, uh, right now, like generally we allow them one, half an hour TV show a week and one movie a week. Hmm. That's uh, where we'd like to be, but then kids get sick, yeah. you know, yeah. things happen yeah. and, and, yeah. and you, you end up stretching it a little bit, but I, yeah, I really believe that there, there's a, there is, um, there's more potential for abuse for certain aspects of screens than for others. I think a phone is much worse than TV. Mm. Mm -hmm. I I believe video games are worse because they because kids who want to play will play video games, mm. and it will replace physical play. Mm. They can get thrill, they can be excited, they can even do something social by playing Halo mm. um, instead of running around in the park. Yeah. Whereas, at least with my kids, generally. Uh, if they are ready to play, then they'll go play physically. It's when they want downtime and they're quiet that they reach for the screen. Yeah. So we prefer that they play board games, that they read, that they do other things, play music in that time. Mm -hmm. um, but it feels less threatening to that physical aspect of it. And I, I believe that's true. Yeah. Um, I think that the exposure to blue light associated with screen times is also really a problem for children's health and mm. dysregulation of sleep. Mm. Um, uh, like Christian Thibodeau has talked a lot about the idea that the dopamine system in the brain is entrained through exposure to ex excessive exposure to screens in a way that will potentially make somebody have attention problems later in life, have less less access to their athleticism, various things. And a lot of that speculative, I, I can't speak to how mm. secure that research is. Yeah. Um, but I definitely 
agree that we need to be very careful about application of screens. And it's it's an extraordinarily powerful tool as a parent. Mm, I mean, you're like, absolutely. I need to have this argument with my spouse. We got to work this out. The kids are on top of us. Like, oh, I know if I put on, you know, the legend of Korra, they'll leave us alone. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes it's okay for a parent to do that, but it's very easy to fall into a kind of a tractor well of mm. constantly leaning on this tool mm. in a way that's really harmful to children long term. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I hear stories of, you know, people with young children um, and they've got the TV on, like they're, maybe they're working from home or something and just they just leave the TV on, you know, all the time. So the kid, you know, can go and do what it likes, but it's always there. The, the TV is always on. They can always come back to it. Mm. Um, and things like that. And I, I mean, for me, I, I find that problematic. Um, and I, Absolutely. yeah, I think there's lots of issues that we're sort of, we're still, we're kind of digging ourselves our own hole <laughs> as a society wow. by, by falling into the trap of using technology as a, as a babysitter, as a comforter, as you know, all these things. And, and yeah, I mean, hmm. we're digging our own hole, but we're also, it's, it's like, There are there are, there are, there are companies that recognize that this is an extremely effective way to create consumers. Mm, oh, absolutely. And yeah. and so there's a there is a top down and bottom up thing, right? Like we we can be better at fighting it, and also like it is a these technologies are very very new. Mm. Right, something like the smartphone. Yeah. Um, one of the researchers I really like is uh, Jonathan Haidt, who's a social psychologist. But he wrote a book called *The Coddling of the American Mind*, mm. and it tracks that there has been a spike in mental illness in young people, particularly young girls. Mm. Um, and this is associated with kind of safe space culture, cancel culture, the sense that that everything is threatening, microaggressions. Um, he tracks that to to three primary variables, he and Greg Luciano. One is um, the political capture of our inst educational institutes by one political party. So almost all of the educators in the country are on the left, mm. which it's not that there's anything necessarily, it's not that the left is wrong and the right is correct, but there's no balance. Mm. And therefore that perspective is there is kind of indoctrinated into students. Mm. And so the, the alternative other perspectives are viewed as threatening. Mm. So that's one aspect. Second aspect is loss of rough and tumble play, which we've already talked about, right? Mm. The last is the rise of social media and particularly access to smartphones. So um, since social media took off, the rates of suicide depression, self-harm, anxiety in girls, uh, like 11 year old girls have absolutely skyrocketed. Yeah. And it seems to be particularly harmful to girls more so than to boys. Um, at least as far as mood and, uh, suicidal ideation mm -hmm. and self-harm behavior. The, the phone is a, this extraordinarily addictive thing, mm. right? Oh, you absolutely. Can, you, you know, <laughs> like I said, like I just got interviewed by Jordan Peterson this week, which means that my phone is blowing up. Every time I check my social feeds, there are just tons of new stuff going on. Yeah. And so a lot of it's really rewarding. Some of it's like super punishing, but either way, it's kind of like a, mm. it's a hyper salient stimula yeah. that wants me to go back, you know? Yeah. So you want to update, update, update. And, um, and so you can imagine if you're a young person mm. in your early teens, yeah. And you can go post a picture of yourself on Instagram and get hundreds of responses that that is very, um, it, the word that I, I want to use is in training, which may be kind of complex terminology for people to use, but dopamine in the brain is an interesting chemical. It doesn't actually make us feel happy. Mm. Like people think that dopamine is a happiness chemical. Yeah. It is a reward chemical, but the primary thing that it does is it makes you want to repeat, repeat the behavior that's associated with it. Yeah. And when you get a spike of dopamine, it's usually associated as it levels off with, with an experience of pain. Mm. Mm. So you actually feel a little upset when the dopamine is sort of coming down. Yeah. 
Now you have endocannabinoids, endorphins, endo-opioids, serotonin, all these other systems, oxytocin, um, that actually kind of give you warm and fuzzy feelings. Yeah. But you'll, if you think, if you pay attention to your mind and you like get on Twitter, you may find that like your baseline state is slightly irritated mm. and not extremely happy, but that you cannot stop doing what you're doing. Mm. Yeah. That, it, that it's extremely, it's extremely entraining. It, ma it makes you want to continue the behavior, even though the behavior is not actually, mm. doesn't seem to make sense to your goals. Yeah. It doesn't even feel good to do. No, exactly. Yeah. Now imagine, you know, having the self-control of an 11 year old yeah. and being exposed to something that's that powerful mm. in entraining you. Mm. I think a smartphone is probably something like cocaine mm. in its ability to entrain behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, you know, I, I don't know that for sure. And, you know, that's yeah. speculative, but it it is a, it is, it's a, it's an extremely powerful. I've heard, you know, some people I really respect refer to social media as the dopamine drip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're, uh, yeah. When we, when you expose kids to that, you're taking their attention away from the physical world, taking their attention away from their families, mm. and you're putting their attention into a system that is extremely distorted. So every time that you look at social media, you're seeing a curated feed. Yeah. So it, it creates like, and it's getting worse, right? Like now there are all these AI filters that can mm. make all of your friends look incredibly beautiful. There yeah. are, you know, apparently everyone else in the world is perfectly beautiful all the time, right? <laughs> That's what you're experiencing and perceiving. Yeah. And then you look in the mirror and you feel like you have a muffin top and you've got pimples. And mm. now that yeah. self-esteem, which is already really difficult to sustain for teen girls is just getting pummeled. Yeah. And then the other thing about social media is that it is the most powerful force amplifier for social bullying that's mm. ever existed. Mm. So you put those two things together. You take young girls who already tend to have a spike of negative emotion at that age, have self-image issues, have body dysmorphia issues that kind of come just with the changes in their body and the changes in the hormonal systems. Mm. You expose them to this extremely entraining behavior that tool that then exposes them to a totally false world yeah. that they can't compare to. And then give them access to just absolutely brutally destroying each other. Yeah. It's it's a disaster. It is a recipe for so disaster. For me, kind of like with screens, it's like do not allow your children to have a smartphone until they're at least 16 years old. That's the number one thing. Mm. Number two is no video games. Number three is keep the 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 TV to a minimum. Yeah. Like a couple times a week, I think is fine. Um you know, the research actually shows that there's no, that there's a, you begin to see a substantial deficit in like mood and stuff after people consume about two hours of TV a day. Yeah. So that's quite a lot mm. compared to what we're saying. Yeah. But it's still a lot less or screen time. Yeah. It's still a lot less than the average person is doing. Yeah. I mean, my, my um, daughter, she's 14. She has friends that, you know, spend probably, you know, 10 or more hours a day on screens. Yeah, that is so incredibly inhuman. Mm, it is, it is. And yeah, I, I think this is a really important topic, but I, I want to spin it back around to what you do. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and interestingly, I actually went with my daughter yesterday into Adelaide and we did a like a parkour session in town oh, with the South Australian Parkour Association. And it was great. She it loved was, it. Was it I, Travis? Uh, it was actually with a guy called Ricky who said he went to one of Ricky your retreats. Ricky Hartley? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So he, said awesome. to say, he said to say hi. That's sweet. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, so it was a really great session. And, um, you know, I joined in because I was curious um, and my daughter just loved it. And and it was interesting because a lot of the stuff that you talked about earlier sort of popped into my head. It was like, you know, because I, I actually also have a personal trainer and I, I go see her a couple of mm -hmm. times a week. And I've been doing that for, you know, quite a long time. Um but doing the session outdoors yesterday, it was in the city, but it was still, you know, we're in a park and things like that. Just being outdoors and jumping and running and and doing more, I guess, natural movement to, for want of a better mm -hmm. term. Um, 
I felt sore at the end of it and I was a bit, you know, really tired last night because I also then went to tap dancing class. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but this morning I actually don't feel as sore as I would as if I'd done, you know, maybe a fitness session. I guess obviously I wasn't isolating muscles in the same degree, but I was still moving a lot and jumping and swinging and things. And I found that really interesting that the the movement and I found a lot of joy in the experience as well as as did my daughter and yeah I found that really beneficial and I you know like in the intro I said you know you you used to teach or you still teach parkour in your retreats and things um but you're not doing that as a full-time business anymore I assume um but yeah I just was curious if you could talk a bit about you know why why someone gets so much more joy and you know still experiences the fitness elements of doing a workout but in nature doing these movements and yeah can you explain that a bit because that's sort of um, that's where I'm sitting at this point in time yeah sure we have a fundamental drive to explore the world physically Mm. and then to play with the capacities that we have to move through the world yeah it's it's just fun like every kid will climb a tree Mm. You put a cool looking tree in front of it. The kids are going to be up that tree in a second because, because that's how we mapped the world Mm -hmm. and mapped our capacities in the world throughout our evolution. Yeah. Primates do the same thing Mm -hmm. and that you're tapping into that. So I call this, you know, it's exploratory locomotor play. That's, that's what parkour is at a fundamental level. And it's something that we all are innately driven to do and rewarded by. Um, If it's, if it is supported correctly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because when we when we grow up and we don't have those experiences, we can not be able to see how to scale the chain challenges appropriately to us. So we become too afraid when we do it, or we we're afraid of the social consequences of people seeing us do it, mm-hmm. or we just can't. We find one challenge, it's good, and then we can't see the next challenge. And a lot of that has to do with just not having a developed vision for it. Mm. But children have this super strong drive to do it inherently. And if that is let kind of develop naturally, mm. um, then then you you kind of you have that. You can see the world. You can see the world and how you can play with it. And that taps into the inherent drive of play that is rewarding. Play is fun. Mm. That's that's part of its its thing. When we do fitness, uh it can be fun. It can be rewarding. Mm. But a lot of times we are structuring it such a way that we're trying to just focus on the physical demand that the body gets. And we're not attending to the experience of creativity, the experience of exploration, the experience of play, the the social and emotional layers of a practice. Yeah. And that's why a fitness practice can also feel very boring and very drudgerous mm. because essentially it is basically the factory model mm. applied to it, right? Yeah. So, you know, sets and reps. Mm. Literally, like, think about, like, a classic fitness gym where, you know, curves. I don't know if you guys ever had curves in Australia. Just have a circuit of machines that you go through, mm. and then they, and you you use that machine, and it improves this one area of your body. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's like a mechanic shop where they're going in, <laughs> I'm like yeah. well okay here's where we we change the windshield wipers here's where mm-hmm. we change the oil yeah. here's where we change the carburetor fluid like i don't know if carburetor fluid is actually a thing transmission fluid uh, <laughs> it's okay <laughs> i'm not a, i'm not a car expert no. uh, um yeah we get the picture though yeah <laughs> so so this is how we've conceptualized we've, we're concept fitness it's like the medical model be... as well isn't it the medical yeah. model where we we put bodies yeah. into you know the heart and the lungs and the stomach mm-hmm. and and this you know it's all these things but it's not actually looking at it it's not the ecology right yeah mm. we've conceptualized the body as a machine mm. and we use machines to make a better machine mm. but we and don't a lot of people ecology. think in that sorry to interrupt you but a lot of people think in that way as well it's like you know i'm sick something's wrong with me i'm going to yeah. go to the doctor the doctor's going to fix it yeah yeah, yeah. it's a mechanic mm. mechanical approach So now the reality is that your body is, uh, responds to stressors, whatever kind of physical stressors that you expose it to. Mm. So any physical practice that's, that involves challenge, it's going to make your body stronger. Mm. So 
when you go do jumps, you get better at jumping. Yeah. And that means your muscles may firm up and get thicker and your body fat may change its distribution or disappear a little bit. So all those mm -hmm. fitness benefits come through the practice of movement. Yeah. Um, sometimes you may want to bring in tools and understandings from the fitness world to mm -hmm. help fill the gaps. Yeah. Right. Because we don't start from natural movement. We start from sedentary. We start from overuse injuries associated with sport. Mm -hmm. So the way that I like to think about movement is that the, 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 the natural movements, the evolutionarily derived movements, uh, they're like whole foods, right? Mm -hmm. Now you're Very talking my language. <laughs> <laughs> so climbing a tree is mm. um is is like eating a whole food meal to me right mm. you're yeah you're going to strengthen your lats and your grip and your biceps mm. but also you're going to be moving in many different dimensions your mm. perceptual system is going to be having to resolve what's happening you're going to be feeling intensely the the thing the 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 tree branches if you, um, something I've talked about a lot about is, uh, the way that it impacts you is actually much broader in the body. So this is an insight that I got from Katie Bowman, every tissue in the body, except for the, the, the nerves responds to force, right? Mm. So you, when you, when you take that cell and you, sm you can essentially smash it you can compress it. You can stretch it and you can smear it. Mm. And based on the types of forces that it experiences, the cytoskeleton at the cellular level will become more robust to the type of stressors that you give it. Mm. Now, if you habitually give stressors to a tissue in only one way, mm. then you'll create lines of force in that tissue that are only adaptable to certain types of exposure. And the classic example of this is someone who does something like CrossFit or gymnastics or calisthenics mm. or, or, or like powerlifting. If you look at their hands, you'll see calluses on the fingers and just below the fingers. Mm. But if you, if you feel the skin, maybe in the middle of their hand, mm. it will be just as soft as an office workers. Mm. And that creates a problem because it creates a, a, a um, proportional strength problem in the structure which is now that you have very strong, heavily adapted skin, because that's what callus is. Yeah, Callus isn't a problem. Callus is how your skin adapts to being loaded. Mm. But now you have very callous skin next to very soft skin. Mm. And so when that callous skin pulls too hard, it rips the soft skin. Mm. Now, because I climb trees all the time, my hand is calloused from the base to the top of the fingers. Yeah. So this is whole food movement for the skin of my hands. Yeah. Now, that's why I think of this as whole foods. Mm. But I also say, spend a lot of time sitting at a computer because of the nature of my work. Yeah. And so I'm spending a lot of time hunched over with my hands in front of me. Mm. And maybe I go climb the tree and it's taking me into some of these positions, but I can't access them very well. My body's having to compensate around the limitations that have come through the overuse that I'm doing and the underuse that I'm doing. Mm. And that's where it helps to have a intentional structure to try to nourish more, more tightly. And the way that I think of that is like taking a supplement, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, eat your whole food diet. And now you live in Washington state in the winter, it's gray and cloudy and you're don't like fish and it's hard to get enough vitamin D. Mm. So you take a vitamin D supplement. Yeah. You don't rely on only supplements to try to make up your diet. It's impossible. Yeah. But occasionally you need to add supplements in to support the structure. Yeah. And that's the same thing. That's the way that I look at fitness. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. When you were talking just then about the tree climbing and, and as a whole food and it made me think about how not only is it the the physical nourishment that you're getting of you know swinging or climbing um but the fact that you're actually you're also connecting to nature as well that's another form of nourishment that your body is yeah. receiving in that process um yeah so that's i thought that was quite interesting 
Um, we're going to have to wrap up really soon, but I, I just love your brain. You've got so much <laughs> knowledge in there. You've read so yeah. widely. Um, you've really researched and, and, and experienced a lot in, in your time here on this planet so far. So, um, yeah, it's fascinating um, the depth of knowledge that you have about this topic and, and all the related elements to it. Um, but I guess just to wrap up, um, I'm not really sure how to wrap up. It's it's just, there's just so many unanswered questions for me here. Um, but I guess, you know, speaking specifically to my audience, um, as we get older, so a lot of people in my audience, I guess are generally a bit older, maybe haven't done a lot of, physical activity or they do yoga for instance because I teach yoga um, or they do do other forms of activity I mean a lot of the people that come to me want to stay fitter and healthier and stronger for longer as they age that's their goal um, so what advice quickly off the cuff would you give to someone who's in that sort of older age group who wants to remain physically strong and healthy and active um, perhaps you know parkour is very daunting. Um, but what I you know, what sort of suggestions would you make to someone um, so that they can live a, you know, a really strong and healthy life as yeah. they age? Um, so the first thing I would say is I would really love for people to start to recognize the parkour doesn't have to be daunting. No. That, yeah. That I discovered that better, yesterday. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just exploration and locomotion, right? Mm. It, like the first obstacle is just distance. It's just get from here to there. Yeah. Right? You can apply this exploratory, playful mindset to how you get up out of a chair. Mm. You can apply it to getting up and down off the ground. Yeah. You could say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna develop new skillfulness, new mm. options, new opportunities in how I do movement in my day to day life. Yeah. And that's parkour. Mm. Um, so you can start parkour today. You don't have to ever jump off a building or between buildings or do a flip mm. or even do a vault and yeah. you can still do parkour and it can still make you have a much more meaningful experience with the world and a much greater sense of confidence in your body. And the place to start for me is actually just go for a walk. Mm. Well, step outside your door and walk through the world. And if you can go somewhere where there is nature, go be in nature. And if you can take off your shoes, take off your shoes. Mm. And if you can hang from a tree branch, hang from a tree branch Yeah, and start there and feel what it feels like in your body. And when you feel joy and love, follow it, mm. right? The ultimate sustaining power to a practice is that it makes you fall more in love with your experience of being. Mm. So it doesn't matter what the best program is that's going to give you the best abs and the strongest biceps and whether you're, you know, you should be doing 80% of your one RM or 85%, like none of that is the place to start. Mm -hmm. The place to start is what makes me fall in love with the experience of moving my body? Mm -hmm. How can I build more of that into my life and then build su systems that support that so that I can access it better? So I can mm -hmm. do the things that I love with greater freedom and capacity. Mm -hmm. That's where I say to start. Yeah, well, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, it's definitely an area I want to explore a bit more, the the whole parkour thing um, and possibly even teach it at some point down the track. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to, I've always loved movement and, and done things like, um, you know, dance and uh, improvisation and things like that. So that's something that really lights me up. So yeah, Ricky is great. Right. Yeah. He's a super playful coach and mm. he's been moving in nature. And so if you can get down to Adelaide and spend some time with Ricky, I can't recommend it enough. Yeah, no, I will. He won't require you to jump over any buildings. <laughs> Good. Cause that ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray, for joining us yeah. in the wellbeing Thank room today. Much. Such a pleasure to have you here. And um, yeah, I really appreciate your time and I'm looking forward to sharing this conversation mm -hmm with our listeners and viewers on YouTube. So yeah, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Yeah, you too, Leah. Thank you.